Good morning. I hope some of you are joining us via Facebook Live for our Bible study lesson this morning. We're going to take a few moments and let people start gathering. It's just a little bit before the official start time. So please come on in. And uh, if you're there, uh, someone send across a few uh, comments and let me see that you're there and know that uh, we're actually getting out. Hello, Lori. Hello, John Eric and family. Hello, Summers family. Glad to see we're making it. Uh, so this week is a different setting than the last two weeks uh, have been. Hello, Jim and the Mustang family. Uh, I've been at home the last two weeks uh, broadcasting this lesson, and today I'm able to be here at the church. I'm in the parlor uh, at Wilshire, which you may recognize, which is the normal home of our discovery class on Sunday mornings uh, where we live stream. Some people have been asking about uh, how to access these Sunday School lessons when they're not on Facebook, and you may have friends or family members who are not on Facebook who would like to access this lesson and the previous two lessons. Uh, the previous two weeks' lessons have now been converted to YouTube videos, and they're available on our YouTube channel and will be posted on our uh, site, uh, our WilshireBC.org site uh, as well. So uh, this is the most expedient way to get the lessons out while the sanctuary is being prepared for our worship time this morning due to the uh, time restrictions and equipment restrictions uh, that we have. All right. Hello, Vicki. Hello, Dave and Carrie. Hello, uh, Catherine and uh, Raylan, Kathy and Raylan. Uh, so glad to see familiar names popping across here. Uh, hello, Ellen. Yeah, nice to see you as well, uh, Catherine. Cook family, welcome. I feel like uh, that the children's TV personality of my childhood, who was uh, had the uh, sort of magic magic mirror, and I see Stacy and uh, Johnny and Jimmy and Susie uh, through the mirror, and <laughs> I'm seeing all of you as we begin our lesson today. All right, well, it's time, <clears throat> and um, this is the third uh, in a series, an impromptu series that we've put together uh, about living in a time with coronavirus. Uh, if you have a Bible with you this morning and would like to open it, I, I want to encourage you to find Isaiah chapter 40, which is where we left off in last week's lesson. We're going to get there in just a few moments after some introductory comments. I'm still adapting to how to teach an adult lesson without interaction and uh, appreciate your uh, forbearance in that. I will ask some questions that I really want you to think about, even though I can't hear you responding to me. <clears throat> in the last two weeks, we've talked about <clears throat> the fear and the hope in this time of living with coronavirus. And today, I want us to move our attention to uh, waiting in a time of coronavirus. So today's lesson is titled, Waiting in a Time of Coronavirus. Now, to get your mind active and uh, working on this, I invite you to begin thinking now about different kinds of waiting. Imagine, if you would, or recall some of the kinds of experiences in life that you've had that caused you to wait, and think about maybe how they differ from other kinds of waiting. In the Christian church year, we most often associate waiting with Advent, which is that annual period of anticipating the reenactment of Jesus' birth, of hope being born anew into a broken world. And we talk about Advent meaning to wait and to anticipate. But living on this side of the BCAD divide, we really just pretend to wait as a kind of spiritual discipline but the truth is, we know that the baby is going to be born. We know how that story ends. We wait for Christmas, 
knowing there will be presents. And yes, the waiting is hard, especially for children, but we know that Christmas will come. As certain as Christmas is, there are other things we wait for that we're pretty sure are gonna happen, but we just don't know when they're going to happen. Today, on a lighthearted note, hopefully, we all know that at some point in the near future, we're going to run out of toilet paper. We just can't predict when. Now, some of you have calculators and you figured this out and all. On a more somber note, when living with someone who has a terminal illness, we know death is inevitable, but it is the uncertainty of waiting that makes living so difficult. When we know something, whether good or bad, is going to for sure happen, but we don't know the timetable, we become unsettled. Can you perhaps think of other examples of this second kind of waiting that you've experienced as well? And then a third kind of waiting is this. We sometimes wait for things we have no guarantee will happen at all. We wait for broken relationships to be mended. We wait for healing to come from an injury or an illness. We wait for a business deal to finally close. We don't know if these things actually will happen, but we wait with anticipation that they will. It is this third kind of waiting that we are all experiencing right now. We are isolating ourselves in hopes of stopping a killer virus, a global pandemic that we have no guarantee can actually be stopped. Perhaps you, like me, are unsettled about the uncertainty of our present crisis. Even for those of us who are not ill and do not have family members or friends who are ill, the fear of the unknown can be paralyzing. Last Friday, after our 14-day self-imposed isolation for having recently traveled from Spain, after that had expired, I ventured out to the grocery store for the first time actually to two grocery stores to get what we needed. And in the middle of Tom Thumb, I found myself having a panic attack. It wasn't that the store was too crowded, it was not. It wasn't that I needed life or death supplies that I couldn't find. The only thing missing was toilet paper. Somehow the surreal nature of shopping like a madman in a half empty Tom Thumb on a Friday afternoon overwhelmed my senses. It was the context and the realization of our new reality that scared me to death. My chest tightened and I imagined right there that I was coming down with a sudden case of COVID-19 right in the middle of the canned foods aisle. Of course, that's not what was happening. But do you know that sense of panic that sneaks up on us in times like these? I suspect, suspect many of us have experienced that and are experiencing it still. And then last night after dinner, a sadness fell over me as I once again mourned the loss of life as we once knew it. And even though most of us are blessed with bounteous resources, even in these troubled times, we fear the unknown. And God knows there are so many unknowns. We hear stories of healthy people being fine one day and then struggling to breathe with the help of a ventilator the next day. We realize more than ever the fragility of life. And we miss the normalcy of free movement we've taken for granted. One of the things we need to survive these times is perspective. In my after dinner funk last night, I left the house and wandered in the near darkness up and down the streets of our neighborhood. And as I walked, I looked up finally, and I saw something I couldn't figure out. There in the west sky was a beautiful crescent moon, but what was that bright light just below and to the right of it? I couldn't figure it out. It, it couldn't be an airplane or even the International Space Station because it wasn't moving. And yet it was so bright, it seemed out of place. With the help of my smartphone standing on the sidewalk, I quickly determined that that bright light was the planet Venus. And there 
was the perspective I needed last night. In last week's lesson on hope, we ended with a very familiar passage of scripture from Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall walk and not be weary. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Now, if you're like me, growing up in the church, you've heard this passage quoted your entire life, as I have. I've seen it embroidered and decoupaged and etched in stone. It's one of those passages most likely to be commercialized in a Christian bookstore. They that wait upon the Lord, eagles, and all that stuff, right? And yet, what does this passage really mean? These lines come at the end of a poem that opens the second section of the book of Isaiah, what scholars call second Isaiah. In this poem, the power of God is extolled, the reign of God over all creation. You may recognize these other lines from the poem as well. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to live in, who brings princes to naught and makes the rulers of the earth as nothing. The context of this section of Isaiah 40 is to contrast for us the power of God with the powerlessness of humanity. The prophet not only calls us to humility, but demonstrates that we have no other reasonable viewpoint than humility when in the presence of God. How vastly this differs from the prevailing cultural attitude about ourselves and even our country these days. We are a people obsessed with being told how powerful we are, how we are the masters of our own destiny, how our homeland is the most powerful nation on earth, and how with a great America, nothing shall be impossible. And oh, by the way, be sure to say the magic words, in God we trust. Isaiah destroys this kind of self-confidence. And we can hear the prophet clearly only when we get in touch with our own frailty and insignificance in the cosmos. In good times, when we think we and our kind are winning, we cheer for God on high because we believe God is doing our bidding. It's awfully great when God's agenda aligns with our own self-interests. But that's not the backstory to this prophetic poem. The words of 2 Isaiah are written to a defeated people, living in exile, forced to become refugees. These are people in a kind of permanent quarantine, experiencing life unlike they used to know it and uncertain that they will ever know the good life again. It is to these people in despair that the prophetic word comes, they that wait upon the Lord, shall renew their strength. The word translated wait in English here is used in a plural form, which is important for us to understand in our study of this text. Most often, we hear the plural language of Isaiah 40, 31, and without blinking, we flip the plural into a singular. If I wait upon the Lord, the Lord will renew my strength. That's comforting, no doubt, but this is not what the text says. The meaning is better understood as those waiting, plural, those waiting on the Lord will renew their collective strength. This is a word from God to a people, not to a person. Well, how does this truth apply to us today as we are so isolated and yet dependent on each other? Will we ever learn the lesson that we cannot be healthy individually if we are not healthy collectively? I was reminded this week of the old days in aviation when commercial airlines had designated smoking and no smoking sections in airplanes. We laugh now at the absurdity of such an idea, 
that it was possible to isolate cigarette smoke from one end of an airplane enclosed tube flying through the air so that it would not seep into all areas of the plane. That is absurd to us, and yet we acted like it was possible. That prompted me this week to post a meme about one of my all-time favorite sayings, you can't declare a no-peeing zone in one end of a swimming pool. Well, that's a humorous fifth grade boy type of illustration. I get that. But the point is true. Christians are among the most guilty people in the world for turning God's we into our selfish me. Consider, if you would, the, um, the amount of our theology, even the songs that we sing that are about me and Jesus, much more than we and Jesus. The antidote for the selfishness is to go back to creation. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Our God is the creator of all that is, not just of me and mine. Our God is the God of all nations, not just some set of preferred nations. Our God is the creator not just of a planet, but of all the heavenly hosts around us. This command to wait upon the Lord occurs many other times in Scripture besides in our Isaiah text. In most of those occurrences, the same root word is found in Hebrew or Greek. In the Hebrew Scriptures, these run from Genesis to Micah, but the largest occurrence is found in the Psalms. Here are a few examples that might help you understand this. Psalm 25, 5. Lead me in your truth and teach me for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all day long. Psalm 27, 14. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. Psalm 37, 7. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret over those who prosper in their way, over those who carry out evil devices. And Psalm 40, verse 1. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. A similar word, but with an enhanced meaning, occurs multiple times in the New Testament. A word that in English means to wait with anticipation or to wait eagerly. We see this word used over and over again in the Pauline epistles. And here are some examples of this from the book of Romans. 18, Romans 8, 19, for the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. Down in verse 23, and not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. And then in chapter 8, verse 25, but if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. I've been reflecting over the last few weeks still on the many things we saw on our recent trip to Spain and Portugal. American history is so intertwined with British history that we tend to know much more about England and Wales and Scotland and Ireland than we do about Spain and especially Portugal. However, one of the common threads that unites all of these European countries and us is the architectural marvel of great cathedrals. When you travel the world, you will observe that cathedrals were not built in a day. In fact, most cathedrals are not built in even a single lifetime. St. Peter's Basilica at the Vatican in Rome took 144 years to build. St. Basil's Cathedral in Moscow, you know that church with the beautiful colorful minarets? It took 123 years to construct. The York Minster Cathedral in Northern England took 252 years to build. Construction on the Cathedral of St. John the Divine in New York City began in 1892, and the work continues to this day. That work, for example, began before the lifetime of my own grandfather, so that work has been going on for at least four generations or more. Likewise, when recently in Barcelona, 
we were able to visit, albeit the day before it shut down due to the encroaching threat of coronavirus, we were able to visit the famous La Sagrada Familia, one of the most unusual churches in the world. It's not technically a cathedral because it is not the seat of a bishop, but it has been designated as a basilica. Construction on La Sagrada Familia began 135 years ago and continues in a massive way today. Large cranes and scaffolds surround the building, which is both a construction zone and a tourist destination at the same time. The innovative 19th century architect, Antonio Gaudí, designed most of the building. He laid out the plans for it, but when he died tragically in 1926, the church was only one-fourth built. And yet construction continues to this day nearly 100 years later. Here's the thing about cathedral builders. They know how to wait with anticipation, but their waiting is not passive or leisurely. It is active waiting. They busy themselves with holy work, knowing they will not live to see its completion. Like Moses, who led the children of Israel through the wilderness but did not step foot in the promised land, cathedral builders have the patience to do God's work in their moment with the resources they have been given in that time. They know that others will continue building after them. What can we learn from cathedral builders about our situation today? What can we learn from them about waiting? One of the last references to the word waiting in the New Testament is found way back, way, way back in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 14. Therefore, beloved, while you are waiting for these things, meaning the consummation of God's salvation, while you are waiting for these things, strive to be found by him at peace, without spot or blemish. While you are waiting, strive. While you are waiting, be at peace. There's a misconception that while waiting, we have nothing to do, that we are forced into idleness or full-time worry. Whether our kind of waiting is for something we know is coming, or something we know is coming but don't know when it's coming, or whether it's for something we don't know for sure is ever going to happen, we have work to do. Work commenced in faith that God is at work in the world beyond our view and beyond our own individual needs. Work commenced in faith that God will call others to build upon the foundations we have laid, the frames we have raised up, the wells we have dug. We find ourselves now in a time of intense waiting. Some days it feels like we're just waiting for the other shoe to drop. Some days it feels like we're waiting for a train that never shows up at the station. Some days we feel like we're waiting for a train that's gonna come and knock us off the track. The message of the Bible, the message of our forebears in the faith is to wait with eager anticipation, to wait upon the Lord, to wait together, to wait in community while building the community of faith. We have work to do. As it turns out, the best way to stop worrying and pass the time while waiting is to be busy. What is your calling in this time? What is the work that God is preparing for you to do? What is your role in being a cathedral builder in this time, in this place? What is the mission that will help you rise above worry and fear and panic in this moment? What is the contribution you have to give to help us endure this time and to ensure that there is a future for those who come beyond us? As I said at the beginning of the lesson, the secret to waiting is perspective. And so much of the Bible is about giving us perspective that God is great and we are not. 
when we misplace our attitudes and believe that we are great or that our city or church or state or country or leaders or school fill in the blank is great and we dethrone the power of God we lose proper perspective as I walked down the street last night and looked at the crescent moon and saw the planet shining brightly beneath, suddenly I gained perspective that God is about so much more in the universe than I am able to see and to know. I often say to families when I'm gathered at graveside with them, it's important on this day to remember that not everything that is real is visible to us now. This is an important reminder for all of us, and I'm preaching to myself now. To be reminded in this time of crisis and fear that God is still on the throne and there is power at work beyond what we can see or know. It is our calling to do our part in that and to respond to God's call in our lives in this time. What is that for you? That's our question for today. Thank you for joining us for this lesson. I invite you to tune in at 11 o'clock today. Or actually, you can tune in just in a few moments. We're going to be starting the live stream of worship uh, a little bit early this week to get it established. And Ralph Manuel will be playing piano uh, during part of that time. Please tune in via the Wilshire website or YouTube uh, channel. And we look forward to seeing you there. Let's pray together. Lord, hear our prayers. In this time in which we don't know where to turn, we turn rightly to you. I pray now for each one who's gathered virtually for this lesson, that you would pour out your peace upon each one and grant strength for these days. Bless each one who struggles with illness Bless each one who struggles with depression. Bless each one who struggles with anxiety or with the stress of life as we know it now. May your peace be upon all. And may you make clear to us our work in the world to build your cathedral for all eternity. We pray through Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you.